Please open your Bibles with me to Psalm 45. This morning, this sermon from Psalm 45 is intended to accomplish a few related purposes. Uh, Next Lord's Day, I will be preaching at our beach camp, uh, which I'm looking forward to very much. And after that, in two Lord's Days, we'll get back into 1 Peter, which is our main, my main study. And so this sermon needed to be somewhat independent, uh, but it's also related to what we will get to in 1 Peter 3, because in 1 Peter 3, we are coming to Peter's instructions to wives, and after that to husbands. And in this sermon, we're going to see a wedding, a union of the king and a royal princess. And the beauty of that wedding and the union of the king and his bride uh, is, of course, a picture of Jesus Christ and his church. And we know that this is also a picture of a husband and a wife. And so all of these things do connect and overlap. And what we're going to do with Psalm 45 is we're first going to read it through from the perspective that this psalm is about the marriage of a king and his bride. And as we read through it this first time, I'll make a few comments about it as we go to help us understand it. And then we're going to come back and look at Psalm 45 again from a slightly different perspective. And in that second going through of Psalm 45, we'll have an outline of four points. So the first thing we're going to do is read the psalm while I make a few comments along the way. Let's read from Psalm 45. Notice in the title that this is not a psalm of David. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. Let's pause here. The psalmist introduces the psalm as one which is directed or dedicated to the king. This is not David writing. This is not the king writing. But rather someone writing about the king and writing to the king, the sons of Korah. And the psalmist is saying that he's so excited about what's going on and what he has seen and what he wants to say that his tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. The scribe is ready to write, ready to give expression to his words, and the psalmist is just waiting to speak and to pronounce and to proclaim the things that he wants to say about the king. It's like saying, I wrote this for you, and I'm so excited to share it with you on your wedding day. Now, new parents, what do they do? They say, look at all the photos I took of our baby. They just can't help but show you. Or if someone just got a kitten or they just got a puppy, they just can't help but show you the the excitement that they have for this new thing in their life. And that's how the psalmist is right now. He's really excited. He's so worked up in a positive sense about the king and this wedding that he's just waiting, so eager to give expression to his words. Let's continue reading. The psalmist says to the king and about the king, you are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. The king is described as having physical beauty. He is a man of handsomeness. He is also described as someone who has graceful speech. Grace is poured upon your lips. He is also a mighty warrior. He straps his sword onto his thigh. He mounts his horse. He rides out. He has his bow and arrow. And he slays and conquers his enemies. His right hand teaches him awesome deeds. As he he unsheaths his sword and as he wields it, he does mighty and great things. 
Let's continue reading. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Notice that the psalmist here in these verses describes the king's court and the king's kingdom, a kingdom of righteousness, an enduring kingdom, a rich and luxurious kingdom, the finest materials, the finest people, the finest of all things surround the king. We see the gold of Ophir. We see uh, ivory, myrrh, aloes, cassia, and royal persons who attend the king in his court. And now the psalmist switches from, di- uh, from directing himself to the king. Now he directs himself to the bride-to-be. Hear, O daughter, and consider, and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber, with robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes, she is led to the king with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness, they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. Notice that the princess is described equally in terms of great beauty, bedecked in beautiful robes, and she enters the palace with her royal entourage, leaving her father's house to marry her lord and her king. Verses 16 and 17. In place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. First comes love. Then comes marriage. Then comes the baby in the baby carriage. That's verse 16. The king and the princess have been united in marriage. And now the psalmist, the scribe, is looking forward to a royal dynasty. From this union will come many regal sons, princes of the king and the queen, who will sit upon the throne after the king, remembering his name for all generations. The psalmist is praying that the the union would be blessed with many sons to sit upon the throne and a perpetual memory of the king through his family. So we see that this psalm is about a royal wedding of a king and his bride, But we need to read it again and study it more closely because this psalm is also about Jesus Christ and the church. Jesus Christ and the church. And you might think, well, of course it's about Jesus Christ and the church because all marriages are a picture or a symbol of Jesus Christ and the church. But when I say that this psalm is about Jesus Christ and the church, I'm saying it is much more directly and specifically about Jesus Christ and the church than the mere symbolism of marriage. And one of my desires as pastor of this church is to help our congregation to read the Old Testament and read the the entire Bible as a united whole. And we need to see how the New Testament, the Old Testament prepares us for what we see in the New Testament. And the New Testament says, "See, this is what was promised and predicted and declared in the Old Testament." There is a unity to it. And so what we see in the old should foreshadow the new. And what we see in the new should fulfill what was shadowed in the old. And this psalm, Psalm 45, is a shadow. It's a promise. It's a a foretelling, a revealing ahead of time through symbolism and through typology, Jesus Christ and his church. Now, if there was any doubt in your mind about whether Psalm 45 is about Jesus Christ and his church, we can put all doubt out of mind by reading from Hebrews chapter 1. Would you turn to Hebrews chapter 1 with me? Hebrews 
In Hebrews, Paul quotes extensively from the Old Testament to prove various points. In chapter 1 of Hebrews, Paul, or the writer is very much concerned with showing Jesus' superiority over angels. And we're not concerned really with the context so much as we are verses 8 and 9, a specific citation of the Old Testament to speak about Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, 8 and 9 says, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So the author to the Hebrews reads Psalm 45 and says, oh, of course, this is about Jesus Christ. Of the Son, he says this. This is speaking of the Son. But let's, just to be entirely clear, I'm not saying that we should have to choose. This is about a Davidic king's wedding. Or this is about Jesus Christ and his church. It's not an either or. It's a both and. And we are understanding that this ultimately points to and terminates in Jesus Christ and his church. And we could conclude that with sufficient certainty even if we didn't have Hebrews chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. Because this is how the entirety of the New Testament and the apostles within it interpret the old. But I wanted to show it to you because we can put it beyond doubt from Hebrews chapter 1. So if you turn there, turn back to Psalm 45, where we will spend the rest of the sermon. Now, we're going to have four points. Four points to study Psalm 45, which is about the Son, Jesus Christ, and his bride, the church. In the first place, The king's majesty and power allure us or attract us. The king's majesty and power allures us or attracts us. We see this in verses 2 through 5. The king is described as a handsome person, a person of gracious speech, a mighty and strong warrior who defends his people. Now, it is normal, it is human, it is regular that people are attracted to splendor and to beauty. In particular, women are attracted to a man in a military uniform. It's just a fact of life. In fact, the prophets specifically criticize Israel for lusting after the Assyrian and Babylonian officers in all their grandeur. Now, As we look at the king and we see him as a handsome man and a mighty warrior who rides on his royal steed, and we say, wow, that's a very attractive image. Wow, that's a very majestic image of a regal man. What should we think? We should think this is a poor picture. This is a poor picture of the majesty and the splendor of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. On earth, our Lord in his state of humiliation, there's nothing special about his appearance. You wouldn't look at Jesus Christ in his humiliation and say, you are the most handsome of all the sons of men. No, you'd say there was nothing in his appearance that attracted us. But we know Jesus who rose from the dead and ascended to the Father and sat down and was exalted. And we look at God the Son, not veiled in humiliation, but unveiled in exaltation and majesty. And that ought to attract us and allure us. We ought to see the beauty and the majesty and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And we ought to be drawn to him. If we are drawn, if people are drawn by splendor and majesty, should we not be drawn by the most majestic, the most splendid, of all the sons of men, who is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Are you drawn not just to his majesty, but to his power also? People are attracted to power, often for poor reasons, but many times for good reasons. On a battlefield, people rally to the champion, don't they? They rally to the hero. If you go to school and you have older siblings and someone's giving you a hard time, what do you do? You say, my big brother's going to beat you up. 
Because you are attracted to or you are comforted by the power of those who will defend you. It's comforting to you to know that there is one who defends you. There is one who can defeat your enemies. Consider our Lord Jesus Christ. Is he powerful? Is he powerful? Amen, he is powerful. Who are his enemies? Because his enemies are our enemies, and our enemies are his enemies. Satan, sin, and sinful men. Did he defeat these enemies? Can he defend us from these enemies, from Satan? He defeated Satan. From sin, he defeated sin. From sinful men, he defeated sinful men. He rides out on his royal steed with his, ar- with his sword strapped to his thigh and his bow and his arrows, and he slays all of his enemies, which is slaying all of our enemies. The scriptures say that he has disarmed them. He tramples on them. He stomps in their blood. As we look at the majesty and the might of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our King, our Husband, our Lord, our Head, we should be attracted. We should be allured. We should be drawn to. Our hearts should be moved to love Him. Is there a warrior like our king. Is there one who can conquer him? That's great. You say, my big brother's going to beat you up. And then they say, well, my brother, and their brother's even bigger. Oh no, what are you going to do? Our king, Jesus Christ. Is there a creature that can conquer the creator? Is there a devil that can conquer deity? There is none. There is none. So you should be drawn to attracted by, allured by his majesty and his power. There is none like him. He is beyond comparison and therefore without comparison. Let us love him who rides out victoriously and whose right hand has slain all our foes. Remember that the writer to the Hebrews also says that we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we believe and we know that he is indeed sat upon the throne, and he is indeed ruling and reigning. Do you believe that? Then you will believe that he defends you, and he can defeat all your enemies. This also encourages us in the fight against sin. How can I fight this enemy? How can I overcome this temptation? How can I have victory on the battlefield of sanctification? Because my Lord and my King is powerful, and with his might and with his strength, I can defeat my enemies. He has given me His Holy Spirit. He has promised to cause me to walk in His statutes. His might attracts me. His power allures me and causes me to love Him and persevere in the fight. In the second place, the King's stability and righteousness inspire us. Looking at verses 6 through 9, the king's stability and righteousness inspire us. The psalmist says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He's referring to the stability of the royal throne. How do you feel about rope bridges? Positive feelings, negative feelings. If someone said, here is a canyon, and here is a rope bridge, does that inspire confidence in you? You'd say, no thank you. I don't want to get on that because rope bridges are by definition unstable. Even if it's safe, it just does not feel safe, does it? Because it's so movable. It's so unstable. There's no firm footing. When I see videos or pictures of someone doing a tightrope walk from high buildings or over some great distance, I think, you're insane. You're insane. It's so unstable. How do you feel about cliff climbers that camp on the side of the cliff? You know, they bore holes in the, in the stone. They put some kind of peg or or nail in there and then they suspend their tent on the side of the cliff and they sleep in it. How does that make you feel? Does it give you vertigo? 
Would you sleep well? I would not. I just wouldn't do it. Because I like things that are stable. I like to be on the ground. Except in California where the ground is unstable. But what does the psalmist say about the king? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Stability inspires confidence. In a kingdom, the stability of the king's reign should be very important to you. If you are in a kingdom, the stability of the king's throne or the king's reign, the throne is a symbol for his power and his reign, is very important to you. As goes the king, so goes the kingdom. As goes the king, so goes you. But verse 6 is a little bit confusing, isn't it? This is the verse that was one of the verses. This and its, its following verse were cited, were quoted in Hebrews 1. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So we might say, who? to whom is this psalm addressed? It's to the king, clearly the Davidic king. But in verse 6, the throne is attributed to God forever and ever. Who's the psalmist talking to? Well, in Jesus Christ, these things are united, aren't they? Royal son of David, eternal son of God. Your throne, O God, your throne, O son of David, Jesus Christ, is forever and ever. Our God is our king, and our king is our God incarnate. But there's another reason why the psalmist says your throne is forever and ever. It's not just because Jesus Christ is God and therefore he lasts forever and ever. That is true. But it's also because of God's promises and God's covenant, which he made with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. You don't need to turn there. Just remember that God promised to David that one of his descendants would sit upon the throne forever and ever. And so the psalmist is remembering God's promises. He knows this is David's royal son. And so he has expectations based on God's promises that the throne will indeed endure forever and ever. And that promise is fulfilled. It is brought to completion. It is brought to realization and reality in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his kingdom, which is the church. This inspires confidence in us. Trust, brothers and sisters, trust in the duration of his reign. Trust in the righteousness of his reign. Our rulers last, our presidents last four years, maybe eight. And they don't accomplish much. And whatever they do accomplish could be overturned or reversed by the next president in some period of time. So we rightly do not really invest hope or trust in our kings, in our presidents, in our rulers. But Jesus Christ, our Lord, has sat down, has been exalted, and is ruling and is reigning, and that should comfort us. If you watch political news, are you comforted? Are you inspired? Are you, are you, does it pump you up to say, We're winning, or things are going well. (laughs) No, no matter who's in the office, you're going to say, this is a mess. It is, there are many blessings in it relative to other countries, and we thank God for that, but it doesn't inspire confidence in me. But when we consider the royal throne of of God the Son, the Son of David, Jesus Christ, what does that do for us? We say, his throne endures forever and ever, and I belong to his kingdom. That gives me hope that gives me confidence, that gives me trust. And his kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness. He is a just judge. The psalm says, you love righteousness and you hate wickedness. Don't we want our governors and our president at all levels of government, we want them to punish the wicked and to approve the righteous, those who do well. That's what we want them to do. Do they do that? In so many ways, they don't. And many times there are ways in which, yes, justice is served, but there's also so much injustice. But we look at Jesus Christ and we know, well, let's ask, will he fail to punish the wicked? Will he fail? Will his righteousness be obstructed? Will his righteousness be stopped by something? We'd say, no, his righteousness will endure forever and he will destroy the unrighteous. His kingdom endures forever 
and he is a just judge who will punish the wicked. His kingdom is rich, it is glorious, his royal splendor is unmatched, and his regal majesty is unrivaled. All of this should inspire us to confidence and trust. We should think the church, at large, the church is so weak in, in places or at times, and the church is so flawed, and that's, that's true from a human perspective, but we should have confidence that our king is ruling and reigning, and we should seek to do his will and to ride forth with him to further his kingdom. And we are inspired not by ourselves, but by his might and his majesty, by his righteousness and the stability of his throne. We should also try to live, not try, but we should live righteously, inspired by his righteousness. If his kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness and he hates wickedness, should we then live in unrighteousness? Of course not. In the third place, the king's glory and honor delight and decorate us. The king's glory and honor delight and decorate us. Look at verses 10 through 15 as the psalmist directs his attention to the bride, the royal princess, who will marry the king. A bride leaves her father and her mother and cleaves to her husband, and the two become one flesh. And as husband and wife, the wife submits to her husband, who is her head. And this is a delight for the wife when the husband to whom you are joined bestows glory and honor on you. You enter into his household, but you bow to him because he is your Lord, and as your Lord, he gives you his own riches and his own glory. And in this psalm, the princess is led to, into the king's palace and bows before him. A palace which is glorious and rich. A king who is glorious and rich. And the princess, by uniting herself to this king, she gains all of that glory that belongs to the king by bringing herself under him as her lord. When we consider Jesus Christ in the church, this is just about as direct a connection as it gets, isn't it? How so? Jesus Christ suffered, and then what? Entered into glory. And Jesus Christ, why did he suffer and enter into glory? To win that glory for a people. And that people for whom he won that glory receive that glory and enjoy that glory in him and through him and by him. And he robes his people in his righteousness, his perfect obedience unto God's law. Do we enjoy the glory that Jesus Christ has won? Do we? We do. How much of it? How much of the glory that belongs to Jesus Christ that he has won, he has entered into his exaltation, he has been enthroned and glorified, how much of that glory do we who believe in him and love him and are united to him, how much do we get? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 that we are co-heirs with him. Co-heirs. What he gets, we get. The inheritance that he has won, we get. What does Paul say in Ephesians? God has given us most of the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus and the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Three-fourths of the spiritual blessings? No, he has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The entirety of the splendor and the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ decorates his bride. Think about that. It should humble us. In this psalm, the princess is already beautiful. She's already rich. She's already, in a sense, worthy of joining the king in marriage. We look at ourselves and we say, okay, so this is not about me. 
because I'm not like that. But what is the glory that Jesus Christ gives us? It's a glory that washes away our filth, that washes away our wickedness. It is a glory that makes us worthy, that makes us worthy of being his own precious bride. The princess that comes to the king in royal grandeur, we understand that of ourselves as being the king's own royal grandeur. It's not just a glory that she gets upon uniting to him, but it's a glory that he won for her ahead of time. This ought to humble us so much that our Lord and our love has not only given us a glory greater than some glory we already had, but rather he has rescued us from the shame and from the guilt and the condemnation and the corruption of sin. He he himself humiliated himself. How did he get this glory for us? He took on our flesh. He suffered in our place, and he died, and he rose from the dead to take away our wickedness, our iniquity, our unworthiness, and to bring us and draw us to himself. And then he decorates us in all of his glory, and this glory then delights us. What it should cause in us is a willing and a thankful submission to him. The psalm says, bow before your Lord. And the Christian, the bride, the wife of Jesus Christ, will willingly and gladly bow before our Lord and worship him and honor him and thank him that we participate in the fullness of his glory. Brothers and sisters, when we enter into the church, and I mean physically when we gather ourselves as the church, we should have this mindset That we, we who believe, Christians, are the royal bride beloved by our King, Jesus Christ. And we have assembled to bow before our Lord, whose glory decorates and delights us. We should enter into his house to hear his word and to sing the praises of his name. Even if our bodies are not bowed to the earth, with our hearts bowed to the earth humbly and joyously rejoicing as we praise our Lord and our King. We have left our Father's house. We have left our Father's kingdom. And we belong to Jesus Christ before all and above all. We submit to Him. We serve Him. We love Him. We obey Him. We do not come to church to satisfy ourselves, to do our own will, but to be a faithful spouse to our Lord and our husband, Jesus Christ. In the fourth place, the king's dynasty leads us to doxology. The king's dynasty leads us to doxology. In verses 16 and 17, we see the royal sons that come from this union. In place of your fathers shall be your sons. When your reign is ended, your son shall reign in his place. And his son shall reign in his place. And his son shall reign in his place. And and they shall be princes in all the earth. That's the dynasty of the king. And what happens when the sons pass on to sons and there are sons in their place, and so on and so forth, on the throne forever. Verse 17, I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore nations will praise you forever and ever. They will all look back to this original union and say, we are the sons of the sons of the sons of the sons of this king and his bride. The psalmist sees praise coming to the king as a result of a successive dynasty or a dynastic succession. Now, in Christ and the church, we see this fulfilled in a greater way because the royal family is, interestingly, the church is both bride, wife, and children all at the same time. We know that the king is not replaced by his son because we have an eternal and everlasting king. 
The king sits on the throne. And his bride is an everlasting bride, his church, which is undefeated and continues on forever and ever and ever. So the children of Jesus Christ do not take his place, but rather take their place with him and rule and reign with him. And so we are both bride and children. We are the wife of Jesus Christ, who is our head, but we are also born by virtue of the union of Jesus Christ and his church. And what I mean by that is that in the church and through the church, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, works to cause his children to be born again. And so Jesus Christ and his church have children throughout the generations. Every new believer that is born again by the power of God through the preaching of the gospel ordinarily, these are the new sons of the King Jesus Christ. These are the princes in all the earth. And so the church... And yet the princes are also the bride because then they become part of the church, which is the bride of Jesus Christ, who is its head. So we participate in this dynastic succession of the reign of Jesus Christ. Indeed, it has reached unto us over time and over space. It has reached La Mirada, California. It has reached 2022. It has reached the entirety of the world. And so the princes of Christ, which is also the bride of Christ, has indeed filled the world with royal offspring who rule and reign with him. And this is why there is a certain appropriateness to speaking of the church as our mother, in the sense that we are born in the church and born through the church as Jesus Christ brings forth more of his own children who are then his wife. And it is the church that possesses the keys of Jesus Christ. To whom do you give the keys to your house? To strangers on the street or to your wife? You always give the keys to your house to your spouse. And so Jesus has given the keys of his kingdom to his wife, the church, to us. And it is through us and in us that more and more children are born through the church and the means of grace. What is the result? What is the end of this glorious union and the children that it produces? I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations, nations will praise you forever and ever. Are you Jewish? Are you a son of Abraham? As far as I know, I'm not. My ancestry DNA test says I'm not at all. So am I included in this? Of course I am. Of course I am. I am one of those nations, and so are you, who sing the praises of of Christ the King. And we have the privilege of joining him and joining all Christians in praising him because his dynastic succession, as we look at his church and we look at the the royal family, what does it induce in us? It moves us to praise, to doxology, to an expression, an exclamation of praise unto Jesus Christ. Praised be our Lord. Praised be our King, Jesus Christ, whose might and whose majesty, whose justice and righteousness, whose perfection causes us to love him and serve him and obey him. We are the nations who praise him forever and ever and who remember his name from generation to generation. And isn't this how eternity is presented to us? The lamb and his bride in glory forever and ever and ever? Indeed, Psalm 45 will continue to be fulfilled for all the ages, world without end. In conclusion, I just want to ask you questions based on the points that we've seen. Does the majesty and power of Jesus Christ attract you? Does the majesty and the power of Jesus Christ attract you? And by attract, I mean move you to love and admire Do you think of Jesus and meditate on his goodness and his perfection and his power? Does it move you to love him? Don't be so sentimental, pastor. Look at the psalmist. He's overflowing with love because you can't help but be moved by the goodness and majesty of the king. And Jesus Christ is infinitely beyond any earthly ruler and their majesty. 
Does the majesty and power of Jesus Christ attract you and move you to love and admiration? It should. It should encourage us. It should give us a greater and deeper love for him. He defends me. He helps me to fight my enemies. He helps me to triumph over sin. Does the stability and righteousness of Jesus Christ inspire you? Does it comfort you? Does it give you confidence and lead you on to your own righteousness? As his kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness, and I am a citizen of that kingdom, indeed his very bride, I will live justly also. I will live righteously also. And I will trust that his kingdom will prevail. His kingdom will continue. His kingdom will endure forever and ever. That should give us comfort in a world of many instabilities, in a world of wars, in a world of shifting governments and changing times. Does the glory of Christ decorate and delight you? Does the glory of Christ decorate and delight you? This is really a question asking, have you trusted? Have you believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Who receives the decorations of Jesus Christ? Who receives the glory of Jesus Christ? Is it just anybody? It is only his bride. How many of you have access to my house? Campbell has a spare key. (laughs) Apart from that, it's just my wife. Only she has access to the lack of glory in my home. But only she has access to that. So also, only the bride of Christ has access to his glory. And so when I ask you, does the glory of Christ decorate and delight you, what I'm really asking is, are you united to Jesus Christ by faith? Are you united to Jesus Christ by looking at yourself and saying, I am an unworthy, miserable, and abominable sinner in myself. And Jesus Christ... Have mercy on me. Have pity on me. Have mercy on me. Forgive my sins in your blood. Have mercy on me, son of David, as so many cried out to Jesus during his earthly ministry. Have you left your house, your father's house, Satan? Have you left Satan's house and been united to Jesus Christ's house? If you believe in him, if you trust in him, then you are united to him by faith and he will give you his Holy Spirit to dwell within, to dwell within you and reassure you, you are a child of God. You do belong to Jesus Christ. And through baptism, we outwardly show what has inwardly taken place, that that Jesus and his church have caused another child to be born again. And you join yourself to to his church, to his bride. And as those who are decorated by the glory of Jesus Christ, do you delight in his holiness? Do you delight in the beauty of his holiness and do you, do you de- decorate yourself in that holiness? Do you say, as the bride of Jesus Christ, I will live in holiness. I will keep myself pure unto him and only for him. When we give in to temptation, we commit adultery against Jesus Christ by loving the devil, by loving the world, by loving ourselves more than him. But the beauty of Christ's decoration is that it washes that away. It washes that away. Jesus Christ gives us beautiful robes, and we instantly trip and fall in the mud, don't we? But these robes have a quality to them that the mud just falls right off. We say, oh Lord, forgive me, and the mud just falls right off. What beautiful righteousness and mercy have we received in our Lord. That ought to delight us. Finally, does the king's dynasty lead you to doxology? Does the king's dynasty lead you to doxology? We, we say it many times, but in the church, in Christian life and in the, in the life of the local church, we have to stir ourselves up. The, the scriptures even say this, stir one another up to love and to good works. We ought to meditate upon the dynasty of Jesus Christ. He is building his church. 
He is growing his kingdom. And we should say, praise be his name. Let us participate. Let us have as many spiritual children as we can through the preaching of the gospel. And we should give all praise to Jesus Christ. We should be, you see, Psalm 45 ends where it began. We should be like the psalmist in verse 1, where when we consider the majesty of the king and his kingdom and his bride and its everlastingness, its eternity, we should be like the scribe in verse 1 who says, I'm so moved, I'm so excited, I'm so brought to love and admiration that my tongue is like the pen of a, of a ready scribe just waiting to express. We want to praise and thank our Lord, which we get to do every Lord's Day in a, in a greater and more open way, but we ought to do every day as we thank the Lord in our hearts or sing to him in your home or in your car. Praise be to Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Head, our King, our Savior, and our God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you for your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, who took on flesh and suffered and died for us and for our salvation to win for us an incorruptible glory and to bestow it upon us freely, mercifully, graciously, and gratuitously. We thank you and we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. O oh God, our Holy Spirit, we thank you that you dwell in us, that you remind us and refresh in us the knowledge that we belong to Jesus Christ, that we love him, that he loves us, that nothing can separate us from that beautiful love. O oh Lord and King, our great Head and Savior, Jesus Christ, we love you and we praise you we thank you for all that you have done for us. We ask you to please help us to be a better bride. We ask you to help us to reflect on earth that majesty and glory that you have won for us. We thank you for all that you have done. And we ask you to return quickly, to come quickly, to bring us home to be with yourself in a greater and final way. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, accomplish your will. Crush our enemies. Defeat them, destroy them, disarm them. Defend us, we ask. Help us. We pray to you, our Father, through the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.